Chapter 27 of The Moon Rock by Arthur J. Rees. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Yoganan. The Moon Rock, Chapter 27. Flint House looked a picture of desolation in the chill grey day, wrapped in such silence that Charles' cautious knock seemed to reverberate through the stillness around, but the knocking, repeated more loudly, aroused no human response. After waiting a while, the young man pulled the bell. From within the house, a cracked and jangling tinkle echoed faintly and then quivered into silence. He rang again, but there was no sound of foot or voice. No noise but the cries of the gulls overhead and the hoarse beat of the sea at the foot of the cliffs. A cormoran sitting on a rock nearby twisted his thin neck to stare fearlessly at the visitor. But Charles Tarrell was not thinking of cormorans. Where was the lassa? Where was his wife? He believed they were still in Cornwall, but they might have left the house. But he had been in London a long while. Not so long, though, only twelve days. Twelve days. Twelve eternities of unendurable hopelessness and loneliness such as the damned might know. Was he to fail now, after finding Cecily? He had a responsibility, a solemn duty. He had reached Cornwall safely from London, run the gauntlet of all watching eyes of the police, and he would not go back without seeing Thalassa. His mind was thoroughly made up. He would find him if he had to walk every inch of Cornwall in search of him. And when he found him, he would wrest the truth out of him. Yes, by God, he would, when he found him. But where was he to be found? The crafty old scoundrel might be in the house at that moment, lurking there like a wolf, perhaps grinning down at him from behind some closed window. A sudden rage surged over him at that thought, and he fell savagely on the shut door, beating it with insensate fury with his fists. Damn him! He would force his way. The comorant ruffled its greenish feathers and watched him curiously. The faint cries of the gulls overhead seemed borne downward with a note of mocking derision. Charles Turrell stepped back from the door with an uneasy look at the comorant as though fearing to detect in its unreflecting beadiness of glance some humanly cynical enjoyment at his loss of self-control. The wave of feeling had spent itself. Not thus was victory to be won. He paused to consider, then tried the knocker again. The knocker smote the wood with a hollow sound, like a stroke on the iron door of a vault, loud enough to rouse the dead. Charles Terrell had a disagreeable impression of Robert Terrell starting up in his grave clothes at the summons, listening. But no. The dead man was safe in his grave by this time. He had forgotten that. A sudden silence fell on the house. A deep and profound stillness, as though seas and wind had hushed their wailing speech to listen for the answer to the knock. The birds, too, were silent. The house remained immutably quiet. Charles Terrell bent down and peered through the keyhole, but could see nothing within but darkness. Then, as he looked, a sound reached his ears, a sound like a thin cackle of laughter from the interior of the house. In the gathering gloom within, he had a momentary impression of a stealing greyish shape, a shape which vanished from his vision as he looked. He rose to his feet, his mind groping blindly for some tangible explanation of the spectral thing, but finding none. A ghost? He shook off that feeling roughly. God knows that house might well be haunted, but not by a ghost that could laugh, though there was no merriment in that ghastly cackle. The reality of the thing, whatever it was, could not be worse than the sound. Had he really seen anything after all? Was there some trap about it, some danger to himself? He would have to risk that. The distant sight of a human figure far away on the white space of the moors, clambering over the granite slabs of a stile, turned his thoughts to a more perceptible danger. If he could see that man more than half a mile away, his own figure must be apparent over a long distance in the clear brown expanse. Perhaps at that very moment the policeman from the church town was prowling about the moors in search of him. His actions at that lonely house were suspicious enough to attract anybody's attention. That was an act of imprudence which he had no right to commit. He had not evaded the keen eyes of the London police to be trapped like a rat by a rural constable. It was too dangerous for him to remain there. He determined to spend the rest of the day among the cliffs and return to Flint House when night fell. He walked away briskly at first, but with more laggard step as he plunged into the shelter of the great rocks 
for he had had nothing to eat since the night before and was beginning to be conscious of his weakness. But he strode on doggedly enough for more than an hour until he found himself at a part of the coast he had not seen before, a theatre of black rocks with dark towering walls and a hissing sea whitening at the base. At the foot of these cliffs three jagged conical rocks rose bare and glistening and spray from the broken sea dashing far up their sides. As Charles stood there looking down, he saw a man appear from the edge of the furthest one and walk rapidly across a sloping shelf of rock which spanned the narrow bay near the surface of the sea. His heart leapt within him as he took in the figure of the man. It was Thalassa. As Charles climbed down from the higher cliffs to intercept him, there came to his mind an imperfectly comprehended fragment of conversation which he had overheard between waking and dozing in the train that morning. The voices drifted to his dulled hearing from the next compartment where some men seemed to be discussing somebody of whom they stood in dread, somebody who was forever striding along the cliffs with his eyes fixed on some distant horizon as though seeking someone. The object of the mysterious being's quest, if it was a quest, nobody who met him cared to ask. So much he had gathered, he had heard one of the speakers say, I met an Ebrosolate stalking along like the devil. It's a token of a bad conscience. It is dreadful to think about. I, go, I got out of his way. I'd soon speak to the devil. It's odd. Charles had thought nothing of this chatter at the time, but he wondered now if they were talking of Thalassa. Did the local fisherfolk believe that he had something to do with the murder and shunned him like Ishmael in consequence? He looked like Ishmael at the moment, crossing that wild place, earnestly scanning every nook of those seamed and ribbon walls, sometimes glancing stealthily behind him. His preoccupation in this search, if it was a search, was so great that he never once glanced ahead and he did not see Charles until the young man leaped down the last few paces of his slippery descent and stood plainly forth before him. Thalassa's brown face did not move a muscle as he looked at him. Thalassa, said Charles sternly, I've been looking for you. Thalassa went on, still scanning the secret places of the towering cliffs as he walked forward with Charles beside him. When the rugged passage was crossed, the narrow, wild bay left behind, he spoke. For what? To have the truth out of you, you infernal scoundrel? cried the young man fiercely, his self-control suddenly vanishing at that indifferent tone. You know all about the murder of your master. You're going to tell me, or I'll throw you off this cliff into the sea. He gripped the other's arm as he spoke, but Thalassa tore off his fingers and leapt backward against a rock, a knife in his hand, snarling like a wild beast. Keep off, he cried. Keep off, or by Christ I'll... He hooked the air with his knife. Charles eyed him across the space, affected almost to nausea by his evil glance. What a fool he had been to lose his temper. Not in that way was the truth to be reached. The man before him was not to be terrorized or intimidated. Sicily's way would have been the best. He wondered whether it was too late to attempt it. I was hasty, Thalassa, I said. Come, do not let us quarrel after I have risked everything to get down here to see you. I have a message for you, from Sicily. The face of the man crouching by the rock changed instantly. He made a step forward as if to speak, then cast a gleaming eye of unbelief at his companion. It's a lie, he said. You haven't seen her. I'm speaking the truth, Charles earnestly replied. Do you think I have come back to Cornwall otherwise, knowing the police are searching for me? Aye, you know that, do you? muttered the other. They have been watching Flint House for you. You are a fool to come back here. I would risk more than that to learn the truth, Thalassa. It's for Sicily's sake. I have seen her. She is in London, and I have come from her. She gave me this message to bring to you. She said, tell Thalassa that I ask him to tell the truth, if he knows it. The police are looking for her as well as me. I have heard it so. With these words uttered quickly, Thalassa fell into the silence of a man on his guard and pondering. Charles approached nearer. Thalassa, he pleaded, if you are keeping anything back, you must tell me for Sicily's sake. How do I know you have seen her? retorted Thalassa, darting a dark, crafty look at him. Charles was overwhelmed by a sense of catastrophe. Here was a possibility which had been overlooked. How was he to instill belief that he spoke the truth? A moment passed. Thalassa cast another black look at him and turned as if to walk away. I'll keep my word, he muttered to himself. The young man's quick ear caught the whispered sentence and saw the way. I'll prove it to you, he said. You promised Cicely that you would tell nobody she was at Flint House to see her father on the night he was killed. 
How could I know that unless I had seen her? What else? said Thalassa, facing him with a strange and doubtful glance. You let her in, Charles rapidly continued, and you waited downstairs for her. Afterwards, you took her back across the notes to catch the wagonette. It was on the way near the crossroads that Cicely made you promise not to tell anybody that she'd been there that night. Suppose it's true. What then? Thalassa's voice was edged with craftiest caution. She sent you to ask me for the truth, say you. It would have been safe or not. What else is there to say when she has told you everything? He cast a look of savage jealousy at the young man. Much, Charles spoke rapidly, but his glance was despairing. What happened while you were away from the house? What sent your wife mad? What did you find when you returned? You know these things, Thalassa? Happen I did. What good had come of telling them? To save Sicily. They had not helped to save her. Do you think she shot her father? Thalassa gave him another dark look, but remained silent. You know she didn't, you hound? cried Charles, anger flaring up in him again. It was you. It must have been you. Listen to me. I know almost enough to hang you. I was in the house while you were away and found your master lying dead in the study, and the key of the door in the passage outside. Who could have dropped in there except you? It weren't me. It was done afore I got back to the house, answered Thalassa. What time was it when you left the house with Cicely? I gone half past eight, perhaps ten minutes after. She came running downstairs, her eyes staring and blessing. Thalassa, dear Thalassa, for pity's sake, let me out, she said, half sobbing. Oh, what did I come for? He's wicked. Wicked. It wasn't for me to say anything between father and daughter, so I just opened the door without a word and went out with her. What time did Cicely catch the wagonette? That's what I don't know. She made me go back when we got to the crossroads. She knew as well as I did that the old fool who drives it wasn't particular as to time, and she was worried about my old woman getting scared if she found herself alone and me out. Go back to Atalasa, she said. I shall be all right now. That was just after she had made me to promise to tell nobody that she had been to see her father that night. And by God, I kept my word. Nobody got anything out of me, though they tried hard enough. Well, when she sent me back, I went, leaving her standing, for I had my own reason for going. When I looked back after a bit, I saw her standing there by the light of the dirty little lamp above the crossroads. Did you see the wagonette on the road? Not a sign of it. Just her alone. A faint hope died in Charles' breast. Even the drunken irregularity of a Cornish cabman told against Cicely. But that point was not so immediately important as Thalassa's story that the murder had been committed during his absence from Flint House. Although his own experience supported that supposition, Charles was reluctant to accept a theory which plunged the events of that night into deeper mystery than ever. Well, go on, he said. What did you find when you got back? The house was dark and the door open. The wind was coming in from the sea, sharp enough to take your head off your shoulders, and I thought perhaps I had jammed the door without closing it, and it had blown open with the wind. But when I got inside, I heard something like moaning. I thought that might be the wind too, for it's forever screeching up and down the passages like a devil, especially of the nights. I... He stopped suddenly, with a cautious, sidelong look at his listener. Yes, yes, cried Charles. And what then? Thalassa went on, but a little moodily. I went along to the kitchen and found the old woman lying on the floor in a kind of fit, making the queer noise I had just heard. When I picked her up, she opened her eyes, laughing and crying and making mouths as she pointed to the ceiling. I could get nothing out of her for a while. Then she mutters something about a crash upstairs and goes off into another fit. I carried her into her bedroom and went upstairs as fast my leg would take me. There was light under his door, but he didn't answer when I knocked. I tried to open it, but it was locked inside. In a bit, there was a knock downstairs. You know what happened after that? She lapsed into silence again with another look at the young man. That was when my aunt and husband and Dr. Ravenshaw came to the door, said Charles, filling in the pause. But how was it that you told them that you had feared something had happened to your master? Was that pure guesswork on your part? You hadn't been in the room, you say? I had to tell them something, hadn't I? retorted the other sullenly. If I hadn't told them that, it would have all come out about me going out with Miss Sisley and not into the coal cellar, as I said. It is astonishing that your story should have been so near the truth when you knew nothing of what had taken place. I did know something. The door was open, the house dark, and she in a fit on the floor saying there had been a crash upstairs. Then his door was locked, and I couldn't get an answer. Wasn't that enough? 
hardly enough to warrant your saying that you feared your master had been murdered unless you expected him to be murdered i didn't say that replied thalassa with unusual quickness all i said was that i was afraid something had happened to him there was reason for thinking that i had to make up my story quick that part about just going for dr ravenshaw that was because i had still got my hat and top coat on just as i had come in from the moors and i wasn't going to break my promise to miss sisley did you see the blood under the door when you went up and tried to get in i've told you all there is to tell was a dogged response what frightened your wife so much do you think she saw the murderer that's what i would like to know responded thalassa with a swift cunning glance he turned his face away and looked across the sea the brown outline of his hooked profile more than ever like an effigy carved by savage hands charles scanned him despairingly the feeling was strong within him that he was still keeping something back thalassa he said you should have told the story before you have done wrong in keeping it back it would have been breaking of my word to miss sisley it was of more importance to clear her you could have done that if you had come forward and told the police as you have just told me that she left the house with you before nine o'clock on that night it wouldn't have helped if i had i found out next day that the wagoner did not get to the crossroads that night till nearly ten o'clock it was after past nine when it left the inn what made you find that do you think i didn't put my wits to work when the damned detective was trying to put me into it as well as her i thought it all out then about telling the truth but i saw it would have been no good for her but only made matters worse who would have believed me there be times when a man can say too much so i kept my mouth shut there was so much sense in this that charles had nothing to say in reply in silence they tramped along till they reached the dip of the sea in which the moon rock lay here they paused as if with mutual feeling that the time had come for the interview to end behind them towered the cliffs with flint house hanging crazily on the summit far above where they stood the eye of charles ranged along the shore to the spot where he had said good-bye to sisley not so very long ago then returned to rest doubtingly in thalassa the old man stood with his hand resting on a giant rock his dark eyes fixed on the rim of the waste of grey water where a weak declining sun hung irresolutely as though fearing the inevitable plunge i'd have given my right arm to have saved her from this charles heard him mutter charles found himself looking at thalassa's brown muscular arm corded with veins stretched out on the rock by which he stood it was as though it had been bad for his inspection which was not indeed the case if that arm could save sisley it was utter service but what was the good of that what was the good of his own efforts to help her charles had a suffocating feeling of the futility of human effort when opposed by the malignity of fate he asked himself with aching heart what was to be the outcome of it all he had failed what then it was not until that moment that he realized how strongly he had been buoyed up by the false optimism of hope his consciousness as though directed by the power of a devil was forced to look for the first time upon the hideous inevitability of the appointed end no no not that not that he shudderingly whispered to himself neither mood the minutes passed leaden footed it was silent and still in that wild spot as if theirs were the only two human hearts beating in a dead world it seemed as though neither could bring it upon himself to terminate the interview charles was the first to break the silence he spoke like a man coming out of a dream did that clock upstairs keep a good time he asked in a low voice thalassa turned on him as if not understanding the purport of the question it was going shipshape and bristol fashion in the afternoon what's that got to do with it what does it signify if it was five minutes fast or slow the logic of the answer was apparent to charles who knew he was only attempting to pluck something by chance out of the dark maze but another and shrewder idea started up in his mind what was your reason for hurrying back across the moors that night miss sisley told me to but you had another reason a reason of your own said charles turning quickly to regard him you said so yourself if i had i've forgotten what it was said thalassa with a black look you cannot have forgotten cried charles what was it hope sprang up in his heart again like a warm flame as he detected something confused and irresolute in the other's attitude thalassa you're keeping something back you know or you guess who the murderer is i'm keeping nothing back you are 
I can see it in your face. What is that you will not tell? What do you fear? The gallows, for one thing. You would sooner see Cicely lose a life on them. This bitter taunt, wrung from the depth of the young man's anguished heart, had an instantaneous and an unexpected effect on his companion. No, no, he hoarsely cried. I couldn't abear that. But it's nothing to tell, but nothing to help. It was earlier that night, before she came. I was looking out of the kitchen when I thought I saw a rock move. Then I looked again, and it seemed like a man, though I couldn't see his face. Is that all? Bitter disappointment rang in Charles' voice. That might have been me. I was out on the rocks that night, close to Flint House. It weren't you. It weren't you. Thalassa's reply was so low as to be almost inaudible. I don't know who it was, but I'll take my Bible oath it weren't you. Who was it then? Charles asked breathlessly. A dead man, or a spirit. I know that now, though I laughed when he said it. I know better now. He stopped suddenly, like one who had said too much, and looked moodily out to the sea. What do you mean by that? Never mind what I mean. It's nothing to do with you. A man's a fool when he gets talking. The tongue trips you up. Thalassa, said Charles solemnly, if you know anything which might throw the remotest light on this mystery, it is your duty to reveal it. It's easy to talk. I swore I would never tell. This is the moment to forget your oath. It's fine to talk for you. But you'd come back to haunt me if you knew. He jerked his thumb in the direction of the distant churchyard where Robert Tyrrell lay. Charles looked at his grim and secret face in despair. I hope you realize what you are doing by keeping silence, he said. I am keeping a still tongue in my head for one thing. For one thing, yes. For another, you are injuring Sicily. You are doing more than injure her. You are letting her remain under suspicion of her father's death in hiding in London, hunted by the police. Yet she believed in you. It was she who sent me to you. It was she who said, tell Thalassa from me to tell the truth if he knows it. Is she mistaken, new Thalassa? Do you think more of your own skin than a safety? The end of chapter 27